Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and uh, Alex is not here, and uh, you might be surprised to find out that actually uh, I've been recording for like an hour or so, but um, then the lights went out and everything went away. So it's kind of like a lost hour that you will probably never hear, and that's a real shame because I'm sitting here with uh, Matt Sanders and, and Chris Bissett. And uh, we were having a, a great time talking, weren't we? It was, um, it was an industry-leading discussion. It was, it was. It was. We talked about things that could have changed the gaming industry for decades. Yeah. Literally decades. Uh, um, people wept to hear what we were talking about. People, if anyone had been listening, they would have wept. Knowing what we had talked about. It was the tardigrades. The tardigrades were listening. We explained how uh, giant tardigrades are horrifying. Uh, we made an evil saw machine out of uh, a Jenga tower. That's going to make more sense in a minute. I guess I'll reintroduce everyone since you didn't hear the actual uh, first part of this recording. Uh, first of all, Chris uh, from Loot the Room. Thank you for coming back on the show and indulging me yet again with your presence. You're very welcome. And uh, Matt. Uh, from Sealed Libraries. Uh, thank you for being on for the very first time, and uh, after this experience, who, who knows if you'll want to come back on again, but you know. <laughs> well, you know, it's going okay so far, apart from the losing the recording, but in terms of my enjoyment, we're good. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, next time maybe Alex will be here. It's not likely, but... <laughs> <laughs> And Alex will be here, and what will happen is his recording will drop, and then everything goes foobar in another way. He's probably experiencing <laughs> the same thunderstorm that I had here. Who knows? That would be a wonderful uh, tense game to get into if you had a thunderstorm in the background. That's what causes your Jenga tower to, to collapse. There's probably a lot of people who are very confused as to what I'm talking about right now. So, <laughs> so uh, what we were uh, actually discussing was the Wretched and Alone game jam which is uh, going on for another eight days when we record this. Chris, a brief idea of just what, what is the Wretched and Alone Game Jam for folks that are listening? So the Wretched and Alone Game Jam is a game jam, uh, which is a limited period of time where a group of people get together to make games on the same theme, or in this case, system. Uh, the system for this jam is the Wretched and Alone system, which Matt and I developed based on my game, The Wretched, which puts players in the position of being wretched and or alone oh. um, in the wretched you are the last surviving member of a spacecraft that's been attacked by an alien in matt's game steel library you are a librarian attempting to recover and store away all the secrets and uh texts in the library before invaders get in and you play with a deck of cards and a jenga tower well, now, see, that will at least explain to people what the Jenga Tower was all about. So, uh, so yeah, basically the idea is that you have your deck of cards and you have the Jenga Tower and uh, you want the Jenga Tower not to fall and the chances are you, you will probably lose. It's very likely that you are actually going to lose, so to speak. Yes, at least in the base, like the Wretched and Sealed Library and the, the games that function as the system reference document that Matt put together spells out, uh, you, these are not games that you win. And I think you said that it was like, what, 1 in 50,000? So, something, I mean, some astronomical yeah. chance like that, yeah. yeah. And it's quite hard to give kind of an accurate statistic, right? because a lot of it relies on how good you are at Jenga. Um, somebody who is good at the, the kind of dexterous part of it might survive for significantly longer. I mean, uh, the one in 50,000 does seem like if I ever get there, I'll be uh, very, very happy. Like, I need, I need to make medals that say, I played the Wretched and didn't die. The way to win is that you draw the ace and win. When I say that, I'm doing little air quotes with my finger. Wink, wink, um, yeah. The way to win is you draw the ace of hearts and you roll your d6, which you roll each day. The way to win is that you draw the ace and win. When I say that, I'm doing little 
air quotes with my fingers. Um, the way to win is that you draw the Ace of Hearts and you roll your D6, which you roll each day. Um, and every time you roll a 6, you remove a token from the Ace of Hearts. And if you remove 10 tokens, you win the game. And that is that mechanic. In the Wretched, it represents you um, fixing your distress beacon and having someone answer it. So the maths for how likely it is that you win is based on how many times you have to roll your d6 in order to roll six, 10 sixes to take the tokens off the ace of hearts but also based on the fact that an average jenga game has between i think 25 and 30 pulls before the tower collapses so it's based on you doing that before the tower collapses as well i guess i kind of figured that uh the fifty thousand was sort of a like you would have to have 50,000 games to actually get an accurate depiction of it. What basically happens here, the way I understand it, is so that you, you get the Wretched, uh, and uh, you, you're, you're on the space station, and you're, you're hanging out, having fun, trying to not get killed off by an alien. Then, enter Matt, who uh, takes <laughs> that game, and then can kind of uh, decentralize it so that it's just the basic rule set so that you could put another game theme on top of it. I kind of created that set of kind of base mechanics, and then I made the first game that did so after The Wretched, like had it used the same mechanics to achieve something different. When you did the sealed library, uh, what kind of changes did you have to make from what uh, was originally there? From the wretched, yeah. There's a you know it's a totally different theme, but the the core mechanics, the deck of cards, or set of story prompts is the same. The ten tokens mechanic, the same. A very very different theme. Well, that's a that's fun because when we get to the actual like uh, game jam, like you were talking about, you've had now close to fifty submissions for the game jam, and these are all individual themes that are working off of the same basic rule sets. Yeah, 46. What kind of innovative things have you seen from some of the uh, entries so far? Like, we've seen a great deal of variation on what it means to be alone. So, you know, there are games that have covered you know, the experience of being lonely in terms of not having real connections with people, mm. or in terms of being physically alone through to things where they even interact with well, the idea of how do we really know what it, what is true? How do I know that the connections I have with people are, are, are real? Chris, uh, considering that, you know, you kind of kicked the whole thing off with the original game, what surprised you about all of these entries that came in? Honestly, how uniformly good they are. People just seem to have kind of really latched onto stuff that I... I mean, we talked about this in the bit, the, the lost recording, that I, I wrote the game really quickly um, and didn't, I didn't necessarily know a lot of the things that I was doing in it until I saw other people doing it in their games. And it was seeing other people make games based on this system that kind of almost helped me figure out what I had made in the first place. And that's been really cool to see like every game that comes out teaches me a little bit more about the system and what it can do and what these games are um which sounds like a strange thing to say given that i sort of created it but uh yeah here we are you were pretty surprised by the amount of submissions that you received when you originally created this in a fairly short time period you were like oh this would be a neat idea like you know almost like a narrative focus kind of uh, game you could play with the tower and you could play with the deck of cards did you ever think that it would end up like this that it would get this much attention from other people who wanted to build a game no absolutely not um i mean we uh, didn't even intend to do a game jam in the first place really um that was a completely last minute thing where the, like the day before matt released the system reference document we said should we run a game jam because I had at least one other game that I wanted to write using the system. Matt had another game he wanted to write using the system. So we figured that the worst case scenario was that we put out four games between the two of us and we could then bundle them together under this umbrella of Wretched and Alone. Because, you know, we know a few other designers and we knew people had enjoyed the Wretched. So we were just like, oh, maybe we'll get a couple of people taking it up. Um, and now with a week left, we're looking at having over 50 games, which is just 
ludicrous. Some of the things that you might be able to do with this, uh, with this basic set of mechanics. I know that we were brainstorming a lot of uh, interesting ideas like, oh, maybe you could just do Die Hard, because of course you could do Die Hard. Maybe, uh, maybe you could do the meta idea of having uh, like the bomb under the table, and if the Jenga Tower falls, the bomb goes off. But what were some of the actual examples of games that were submitted for the Game Jam? I think one of my favorites is one uh, submitted by uh, Diogo Oldskull, the Brazilian designer. Um, he picked an iconic scene from Lord of the Rings where they discover the dwarf's diary. You write the diary of their last stand. Yeah, I guess we, uh, we should have mentioned that too, is that there's a big focus on actually journaling or uh, recording what is happening in the game. That's the narrative portion. Exactly. Now seeing all of the new examples that are being given uh, with the Game Jam, uh, Chris, you plan on doing more with the general mechanics into the future? Yeah, I've got ideas for a few games. Um, one that I want to do is a... And a couple of people have already done this themselves. I want to do like a two-player variant of the game uh, where you would play each with your own Jenga towers and you would, rather than like recording audio logs or writing a journal, you would write letters to each other on the prompts. Um, and each player would have their own set of prompts. Um, and I've also got a game that I want to write, which uh, basically, it makes you, after the tower collapses, the game changes and you rebuild the tower and kind of play through it again. Uh, for, for like a longer form version of these kind of oh. games. Uh, but I'm, I'm not ready to, to write them yet, really. I do like the idea of doing a Jenga in reverse. Yeah, there's a game in the jam um, called, is it Adrift? Um, where you're on a, a raft kind of being surrounded by sharks and you're trying to like fix your boat and oh, you right. start you start with one layer of the tower and slowly build it up over the course of the game and that, that's mm. a really cool way of changing the mechanic. Right. I think you mentioned that to me and then I got scared because there were sharks involved. Yes. <laughs> and I like I, I would be fine with it just being the tower, like, you know, that I'm not actually interacting with a shark. It's just that the story revolves around sharks. But, I mean, if you put, like, a little Lego shark next to it, I'd be like, mm, I don't know about this now. It would be sort of like the reason I can't play Raft. There's just certain things. <laughs> you were mentioning this a little bit before about how to, if somebody does have, like, an anxiety about something, like, uh, like me with, with the aforementioned sharks, or, like, sharks that eat unicorns, which is even more terrifying. I don't even know why I thought about that. I'm never going to get that out of my head. But if there are people who have those sort of anxieties, while still keeping a certain level of tension and surprise in the games, what have you found works to, to preserve that, but also to help people who might want to play the game? That's something we're working on at the moment. We're working with a, a safety consultant to try and address this, because... We initially thought with them being solo games that there wasn't really a need for safety tools because the player is ultimately in control of it themselves. But And I think our mistake initially was assuming that as a solo game, people would be in control of that because it was just them. There wouldn't be another player who crossed a line or anything like that. Mm. But we were ultimately totally wrong to make that assumption. And in fact, I think that in some ways, as a solo RPG experience, the potential issues are heightened because you can be playing and be blindsided by something that is quite traumatic for you when you're <laughs> invested in the game. You don't really want to stop and you haven't got somebody else there to discuss it with or to have like an aside with. You've just kind of found yourself in this problematic space on your own and now you want to stop. And, and we realized that we needed to do better on that. And we've, we've taken somebody on to help write an update to the SRD to that effect. And, to, uh, and then we'll be pushing out updates to both of our, our games individually as well. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, I know that they do uh, take some uh, safety rules into play, uh, especially when you have multiplayer games, because you want everybody to be on the same page and you want everybody to still have fun and not feel like you know they're they're in a, a negative or a hostile space when they're playing mm. but you, you don't necessarily uh think about that when you have like a, a solo uh, solitaire kind of game 
Uh, no, and certainly before this uh, jam, my knowledge of safety tools was almost entirely centered around the group experience. Mm-hmm. It was about how you negotiate that process of dealing with it. And we, we are, yeah, we're hoping we can address that in a way that is constructive and, and hopefully can even be a reference point for others. But have you, throughout this process, uh, interfaced with anybody else who's, who's building solo games? Maybe not from The Wretched, but from, you know, other kinds of games that you can play by yourself? I was going to say, I, I can't think of a solo game I've looked at that comes with a safety tool. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly sure... Um... I don't know what Kiana's game is called. Um, it might be called The Dark Tower. Oh, Before the Tower Falls is Kiana's solo uh, journaling, a solo RPG uh, about discovering secrets uh, within a tower. And that actually uses a um, similar mechanics to The Wretched. It uses a tumbling block tower and it uses a deck of cards. Um, but it's not quite as... The Wretched is quite prescriptive in that the prompts are quite detailed. And Kiana's is pretty vague prompt wise, but I'm fairly sure that comes with a note about safety and about not being afraid to, you know, put the game down and walk away from it at any point. And I think um, Takuma Okada's Alone Among the Stars does a similar thing as well. So there are quite a lot of solo journaling and role playing games that do touch on safety. But I think the nature of the Wretched and games like it is that. They're much more guided by the fiction of the game and less so by the player. And so because there is the capability for you to draw a card and see a prompt that is really upsetting or triggering that you weren't expecting, I think there's much more need for safety tools in these kind of games than there are in maybe the solo games that I've played myself. Right. Yeah. Because the, the, most of the action in most of the Wretched and Alone games, you are documenting something that happened and adding detail to it. And that means that when something potentially traumatic is written into the game, Mm. the game doesn't really offer a junction to say, no, that doesn't happen. And that's what we need to kind of guard against or prepare people for. It's, uh, yeah, it's something that I normally wouldn't uh, think about with this kind of game. But I guess it also kind of makes sense, too, on theme, because the theme kind of asks you to build a level of tension, uh, sort of put you in a heightened state of alertness uh, from a lot of the scenarios yeah. that you're talking to me about. So I can kind of understand when you get into that emotional state where you have almost an anxiety and a tension that can build up, that you, you might want to also be aware that, like, no, there isn't a bugbear around the corner. Because, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people I know in Australia who that's got to be terrifying. A bugbear just drops out of a tree. Uh, you want to be able to, uh, to preserve against that. Or sharks. Or something trying to eat a unicorn. Which, again... I don't know why I thought of that. We, what you're doing here is hitting on the greatest hits of what we talked about in the Lost Hour. If, yep. if you had a giant tardigrade on the outside of a spaceship, it really, really would be horrifying. Jigsaw got a hold of a uh, you know, block tower and made you play a deadly game of, of Jenga. <laughs> but you're totally making the diehard one, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> the way the gem has gone so far, I think that someone else will make it. If they do, you're yes. welcome. Yeah, it will, it will get submitted probably before people actually hear the episode. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, we've been both very surprised by the breadth of the games we've had, but also amazed that some things we discussed as ideas we'd potentially work on have come up for other people. And I think that shows that the system kind of naturally led to those places, you know? Like, I can imagine that at some point you'll have two ideas that are fairly similar when people get a hold of the same rule set, but usually they are quite diverse in what people come up with. What's been interesting is that we've we've had a very diverse set of uh, games come out of it. Mm. Then we've got two games about playing a lighthouse keeper in the jam, and that's remarkably specific as an experience, yet two games that well one game released and one in progress that touch on such a specific theme and i think that says well that's a natural place for those rules to go even though it's so specific are your characters in that like robert pattinson and willem dafoe and it's in black and white i'm thinking it's in black and white in my head 
I certainly think that's a big reference point for the uh, the writers and a very obvious po- reference point for playing it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I like you were mentioning before in our last recording, uh, there are a lot of homages. I mean, the wretched itself is obviously a shameless, shameless theft from Alien, um, and I I don't know if it's because the first game was a rip-off of movies, and so other people are looking at them going, how can I adapt films to this, or if the rule set just lends itself to that. But yeah, like, um, Clever Girl by Matthew Gravelin is Jurassic Park, and what a perfect title as well, Clever Girl. And um, what else is a movie? There's one based on Inception, sort of. Final Girl by Cat Evans is um, a kind of, you, you are the final girl in a slasher movie. Like, it's, it deconstructs an entire trope into yeah. a game that lets you play whatever version of that trope you want to, kind of thing. More than most other systems, it simulates this, A, like this rising tension through the Jenga Tower, and also it has that, that against great odds thing that's really common to stories where you overcome the odds. That, that's definitely an element here, too. Although you rarely overcome them, but the odds are there. Chances are... This is not going to work well for you, but you never know, you might actually succeed. And what a tale that would be. Uh, so there's, uh, when this comes out, there's going to be just a little bit of time uh, left in the game jam. Uh, if anybody had a submission that they wanted to put in for the Wretched and Alone game jam, uh, where could they go? What is the process to do that? Yeah, so the jam is running on, um, I always call it itch, I think other people call it itch.io. Um, itch.io forward slash jam forward slash wretched dash jam. Um, but you could also, like, um, if you go onto Twitter, um, hashtag wretched jam, people are talking about it and releasing the games on there. You'll be able to find the link really quickly on there as well. And actually, the with because we've released an SRD for this, it's not just limited to the jam. We're hoping that you know the system will continue to have some life in it after the jam and that the jams are worth kickstarting like the, the system so even if people don't participate in the jam the srd is available and people will always be able to make games using it so there isn't necessarily that pressure and i mean everybody knows what srd means but you know in case i didn't <laughs> <laughs> no that's a good it's a really good point to bring up because it there was some discussion about this after we released it with people. Mm-hmm. Typically, an SRD is uh, a kind of publicly available for free uh, kind of breakdown of the rules in a system that's free of details about setting and some content. Um, and quite often, actually, they're used by players as a free document to access rules. But in, in this case, it's very much um, the thing we did was to write it for designers. It's a way of breaking down the mechanics of the game so that if you want to write something similar, you've got a kind of kit for how to do so. Uh, so there's, it's, a, it's a really valid question to ask. It won't help you play one of the games. It will only help you write your own. Yeah, because if I remember correctly, it actually stands for System Reference Document. Yes. All right. that's good. Yeah. But I, again, that's usually when players are using it. Uh, but so you're basically uh, creating a document, not so much for the, the actual player, you're creating it for the person who wants to use the framework in order to build a game. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, you know, SRDs only tend to come along when somebody writes a system, uh, and I've never written, like, a, a full system before. But in of taking and saying, well, what does this bit do? That's always really been how my games are run. Like, I, I very rarely play, you know, a specific system without DIYing certain things in of my own, or about formalizing that process rather than it being a totally new thing. Why is it a jam and not a jelly? Very good question. Also, I don't know if game jelly sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's not make that a thing. <laughs> uh, now, here's the big question that I have to ask you when it comes to uh, the Wretched and Alone game jam. Uh, who wins? Who wins the game jam? Just tell me now. It's fine. I, I win the game. Oh, okay. You win the game. 
everyone making games based on my game makes me look great. Yes. That's the first honest answer you've got. <laughs> <laughs> It turns out that the real winners were the friends we made along the way. <laughs> no, absolutely not. The real winner was Chris. <laughs> <laughs> friends we made along the way, zero. <laughs> Fair enough. That's why it's called The Wretched and Alone. <laughs> exactly. It's called The Wretched and Leave Me the Hell Alone Jam. <laughs> Stay as far away from me as possible, Jam. If you take one thing away from this episode, it is that the person who really won the Wretched and Alone Game Jam was indeed Chris Bissett. So, just remember that for the future. I do want to say, I, I apologize if some of the audio might have sounded a little bit choppy, or if it felt a little disjointed in some places, uh, and if we might have rushed some things up at the front, as I said, we were having some serious issues when it came to recording, not just from the fact that because my power went out uh, after we were recording for an hour and uh, my file was unreadable, that we had to kind of like go back and try to shortcut a lot of things that we were talking about before. But then because we were having trouble with some spotty internet uh, drops, uh, some stuff felt choppy. It's the magic of podcasting, folks. There's all of these interesting things, and you just hope that everything goes correctly so that you can have a nice episode. And when everything goes wrong, y you bang your head against a table for five to ten hours. And, uh, yeah. But I did want to make sure that I got this episode out to you so that you knew about the game jam because it is still going on uh, and if you want to check it out you can find it at itch.io slash jam slash wretched dash jam as they said like by the time you hear this it'll probably be close to 50 submissions uh, well i mean they've had a lot more submissions but like actual submissions that weren't just spam and also, if you want to check out some of what Matt Sanders uh, does with, with Sealed Library, you can actually find that at sealedlibrary.itch.io. So check that out as well. And like they were mentioning, too, if you're on Twitter and you want to, you know, check some stuff out over there, uh, if you use the hashtag WretchedJam, you can get a good idea of some of the people who have been now using it to create really unique and interesting experiences uh, all their own. While you're there, if you want to catch up with the two folks that are actually in charge of the game jam, uh, Matt is uh, at I am Matt Sanders, and Chris is at Pan Galactic. So you can check them out. I'm sure they've got some uh, things to talk about because, you know, this has been quite a month for them. Feel free to follow us over on Delvecast.com to see all the stuff that we're doing over there right now, including some stuff that we're releasing just on Patreon. Um, it's not just Patreon exclusives either, because we have the Tales of the Mirror Stone four-part epic that we actually had recorded a little while ago and I edited. Uh, that is going to become public uh, in four installments, but it actually all started as a Patreon exclusive, uh, and even some little bonus pieces from the episodes that we do here, uh, those are also available uh, if you're wondering what Shredmas is. There's a little piece about that. It's kind of silly. No, it's very silly. Just let me put it to you that way. Thank you to our shiny level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Nick. And thank you to Drunk Paul, who has helped us uh, upgrade to a level 1 Discord server. You can find us on every podcast app known to mankind, and you can also find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show's at Delve Podcast. And we will come back to talk a little bit about uh, one of Chris's Kickstarters and uh, what is happening with that. Uh, and you get to imagine Sam Fisher with springs on his shoes, the kind of Splinter Cell game you never knew you wanted. But hey, we go there. This is the kind of quality content you can expect as we come up very quickly on episode 250. Yeah, that's happening.
the, the, the best quality programming you can imagine, folks. Dell. Oh boy. We'll see you on the next one. Bye, everybody. I swear that we're doomed. This is... <laughs> <laughs> like, like, the fates are conspiring against us. But, um... I had a blip. It's really upset you're talking to us. It's really upset. The whole system is very upset that I'm talking right now. Have we lost Nathan again? I think no. we might have. <laughs> no, you, you you didn't you didn't lose me. I I might have uh, I might have lost you for a second, um, and then I heard a thunderbolt. We were having so much fun when we were talking about shredness, but that's <laughs> <laughs> there's so much interesting stuff going on <laughs> for that. I mean, that's okay, the, the great thing about English, isn't it? That anything can be a verb if it tries hard enough.